Lord. Praise the Lord. We give God thanks for the testimony as the Lord worked out that job for our brother Farkison. The Lord just opened that door for Sister Janelle. The Lord worked things out. He healed that wound that Malachi had. And so we give God thanks tonight. Isn't he an awesome God? Can we open up our mics and just give him thanks tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're awesome. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes, he's Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. 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 We give God thanks for those awesome, awesome testimonies. Wow. My heart is so enriched. And I'm feeling so happy and blessed to hearing about what the Lord is doing for the saints, for the brethren, and for all of us. Praise God. Praise God. Let me extend greetings to our pastor, our birthday pastor, Elder Romano Willis. We give God thanks that he was born. <laughs> we thank God for allowing him to see another year. And we continue to pray, sir, that you will be blessed to see many more healthy, safe, happy, and blessed years. Praise God. So we give God thanks for our pastor on this special day. And the greetings to Associate, pa Associate Pastor Brown, Associate Pastor Oliphant, who is not feeling too well tonight. So just remember to bear her up in prayer tonight. And... Um, to all our officers, to our youth president, Sister Shani, to Brother Rahim, who moderated for us. We give God thanks for all of you. And tonight we're going to be sharing some information. You, you know I love to give information. You know I love to empower. It's all about empowering us with knowledge. And so this is a presentation that I, this will be the third time I'm doing it. I've, I started doing it in 20. 18 and i've done it every year updating giving an update on where we are as a country so it's jamaica socioeconomic structure and as you can see the subtitle is because knowledge is power there's a lot of information out there that can help us to know how to pray to know how to move to know how to act and it is very important for us as the church to be informed amen so I am going to be looking at the presentation. Someone is saying that they're not able to see the presentation. Correct. You're not seeing, the screen is green. All right, hold on, let, me, let me see. Let me see now what is happening now here. <laughs> okay, all right, just one moment. All right, are you seeing it now? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great, great. Uh, technology is so strange. I. I barely did anything differently. I just reshared the screen. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, all right. So knowledge is power. So we're going to be looking at uh, what is happening in our country. And whether you're not from Jamaica or you're from Jamaica and you're living elsewhere, uh, there's still information here that can help you to help us um, to pray and how to move. Now, this is, I, I want us to, to discuss um, you can put your questions, your comments in the chat. I have one eye over here on the chat. I can't promise that I'll see every single thing, um, but I will do my best. Amen. So a lot of us should know that there is a national vision for Jamaica, uh, and some persons don't know. I will be honest. I didn't know anything about Vision 2030 until I started working for government which is very interesting because Vision 2030 was conceptualized in 2009 and I, I didn't hear about it or rather my awareness wasn't open to it until 2016. So there is a national vision for the country and that vision is Jamaica, the place of choice to live, work, raise families and do business. I'm not going to go into all of these goals and outcomes that you see on the screen, but we have several goals and outcomes that uh, our strategies, our projects, our programs, our policies are all, they're all formulated towards achieving that outcome. 
So for example, Jamaica's economy is prosperous. So this will mean everybody's, you know, happily making money, gainfully employed, you know, not uh, the, the poverty, poverty rate is very low. And these are the kind of things Jamaica has a healthy natural environment. Um, these are all part of the goals of the country that we seek to achieve and obtain. So all of our programs, all of our strategies are in line with this 2030 vision. And we're in 2020 now, and 2030 is 10 years away. So what we're saying is, as a country, we want by 2030 for persons to be saying, listen, the place I want to live, work, raise families, and do business is Jamaica. OK, so we're going to start off by looking at our economy. Um, and by the way, all of the information I'm presenting here is, from, is based on the 2019 ESSJ report. If anyone wants a copy of that report, you can message me and I will, uh, I will send it to you, no problem. So the main drive of economic growth in Jamaica in 2019, uh, there was an increase of 1.5% in value added of the service industry. So this is the industry that deals with services. And uh, there was a 0.6% decline in the goods producing industry. So the it, part of Jamaica, the industry that produces goods and products, that declined, but there was an increase in the services that are provided. What, what happened, we had good economic performance and that was against the background of, there was an increased international demand for some Jamaican goods and services, partly reflected, reflecting growth in the economies of Jamaica's main trading partners. I don't remember, I don't know if any of you remember seeing the news when we sent off these, I, don't, I can't recall the amount, but we had this grand shipment of mangoes that were sent to the US and it was a big deal because it was the first time we were sending so many mangoes overseas to the US. So that was one of the, the positives. Uh, we also had growth in domestic demand due to an increase in our labor force. So we had 29,800 more persons employed and there was also increased consumer confidence. Uh, there's a relatively low inflation rate, falling debt to GDP ratio and an improvement in our overall credit rating. So in other words, we didn't do badly at all in 2019 for our economy. Now, a number of persons will hear about what sectors contribute the most to GDP. And there are some untruths out there. Uh, for example, a lot of times persons speak about tourism, for example, uh, as if it is the biggest contributor to GDP. And so when COVID-19 happened and our hotels closed, there, was, there are a lot of persons who were expecting the economy to just crash, to just totally fall flat on its face. Um, but when we look at the data, the contribution to, to GDP, and, and, and GDP signals how well the country is doing, how much we're, I'm, you see, I'm not a, I'm not a financier, you know, so I won't even try to, to define it. <laughs> you know, I, I'd have to leave that to the, to the economists. But uh, when we look at the percentage contribution to GDP in terms of how much money we are, we are making, um, what we find is that the, the sectors that have the highest contribution under the goods producing industry, and so these would be production of goods, so agriculture, forestry, and fishing, how much fish are we catching you know, in our seas um, and selling and you know, money is being turned over when we, we catch fish, we sell fish, we export fish. Uh, mining and quarrying, exporting bauxite and, you know, just producing aluminum and everything else. And manufacturing, however, in terms of goods producing industry, is the highest contributor towards GDP. So our manufacturing of food and beverages and tobacco and other manufacturing products. The construction industry also is, is not too bad at 7.2% in 2019. For a services industry, this is actually where we would find tourism, which interestingly enough, tourism is captured on the hotels and restaurants. And as you can see here, it accounts for 6.2% of our total contribution to GDP. So with the hotels closing and the restaurants unable to operate, we would not have seen the economy falling flat on its face. 
because we have all of these other industries and services that are, I mean, everybody's affected, yes. But, but Jamaica actually isn't 100% or even 80% reliant on tourism for our survival. So the, in the terms of the services industry, where we find the highest contribution to our GDP is in the wholesale and retail trade and repair and installation of machinery, which in 2019 accounted for 17.2%. So it, it's very interesting because Adam Stewart, who is related to Butch Stewart, his son, um, there was actually a, 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 a social media argument between him and one of the economists because the economist was saying, listen, tourism didn't kill everything. And, and then he came out and he was saying, oh, but you don't understand and, try and, and, and backing up his thing with his figures from tourism industry. Now, we're not saying that tourism isn't important, but we shouldn't feel like it is the only thing that is holding the country up. If I'm, if I'm losing anybody, please let me know, all right? And don't ask me to explain some of the final economics. All right, so when we look at the debt to GDP ratio, uh, fortunately, thankfully, we, are, we continue to decline. At the end of December 2019, this was at 94.3%, which represented a 2.1 percentage point decline. So let me use 2013 as an example. 2013 here shows that we had a debt to GDP ratio that was higher than that was higher than 130 percent so this means that for every dollar that we would have been making we our debt was so much more than what we were able to make so for example um i make a salary of let's say i i, I make twenty thousand dollars for the week but my debt for the week is uh, thirty five thousand so no matter how hard i try i'm always in debt and I always have to be paying the persons that I'm indebted to. So this would have been a very difficult period for the country. However, what we're finding now is that we are, we are decreasing our debt to GDP ratio. So at the end of 2019, this was 94.3%, which means that not every dollar that we earned as a country, we, weren't, we, we didn't have to be so concerned about paying back to our debtors because we were now less than 100% indebted. So this frees up more funds that can be used for all manner of important things in the economy and investing. So um, a lot of these, these improvements that we, we saw, there, there had to be a period of some very stringent fiscal strategies and initiatives to get us to where we are. And we don't know with COVID-19 what it's going to look like next year. But I submit to you, Saints, that in everything, we give God thanks. Because when the pandemic happened and we were able to have, to offer as a country, for example, the care packages and, and to, to, to have these, uh, these subsidies and these, um, these, these financial assistance that we could have, we could offer to persons, to companies, to individuals. All of that is tied into the fact that the economy was performing better. If we were in 2013, where we had such a high debt to GDP ratio and this kind of pandemic hit, we would have been in a much worse state. Matter of fact, a number of us have not even experienced worse. We've, 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 we've been fine. Um, for the year, we'd have had more Jamaicans being more severely impacted because we would have been in such high debt to begin with. So the pandemic happening when it happened for Jamaica at the time that we're experiencing uh, a very stable and increasing economic growth was a very good thing. And it's something that we ought to give God thanks for. Amen. Any, any questions or comments? All right. Now the chat is very, very quiet. I don't know if everybody is falling asleep. Yes, go ahead, Sister Janiel. God bless you. Um, could you just help me to understand again how the pandemic was good for Jamaica? No, no, no. <laughs> I, no, no, I didn't say, did I, wait, did I say the pandemic was good for Jamaica? No, no, I for said for, <laughs> no, no, it's not that the pandemic was good for the GDP. The pandemic happening at this time where we uh -huh. had a lower debt to GDP ratio was good. So oh. that, right. So if it had happened in 2013, where we owed so much more than we were earning, 
-hmm. would not have been able to offer the kind of financial incentives and subsidies and assistance that we're able to offer and 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 the amount of investment that we could put in in boosting our healthcare system for example that would have been affected by the fact that we owed so much money to so many persons but we had we had more we had a we had more of a cushion um, coming out of 2019 because our debt was much lower. So we've been decreasing debt. So if we, if, I mean, if, if I don't, if I owe a hundred thousand dollars and something happened and I need, um, I need that amount of money, I'm going to be affected because I have to pay the debtors first. Because the government has to actually pay its debtors first before it can start using using money so the fact that i don't owe one hundred thousand, i only owe 20 grand right mm -hmm. so it leaves me with 80 grand that i can then use to do my business and to do whatever it is that i need to do so it's not that so the timing of the pandemic in light of our economy was good not that the pandemic was good for jamaica but the timing was so nicely aligned to having a, a good us being on a good economic recovery. Okay, thank you. Gotcha. All right, you're welcome. Thank you so much for allowing me to clarify that. I don't want anyone to leave thinking that Sister Zahara said that the pandemic was good for Jamaica. All right, so what are we importing and what are we exporting? Uh, this is a concern. The reason I included this in the presentation is that there, there's always a lot of um, dialogue regarding the fact that we import way too much. So looking at what we, we import as a country, and these figures here are in US million dollars. So the dollar figure is up for 2019 over 2018. And that's not so unexpected because the cost of these, these products and these goods uh, in a number of cases would have increased. But looking at it, we, we are spending a lot on what we're importing. We import a lot of food, including beverages. We import a lot of goods. We import uh, construction materials. We import uh, motor vehicles. And that's understandable because it's not like we're making vehicles here. And a number of the construction materials, uh, uh, we might not be making those. So some of the, the, the things that the government seeks to do is to lower the country's food import bill. A number of things that we're importing, we can grow instead. So we're spending, and this is in US million, so we can add the zeros after this, right? Expand this by six zeros to see just how much money it is. And so we're spending a lot on importing things and a number of things that we're importing, we, we have the capacity to make them ourselves. So there needs to be, when the government talks about lowering the, the food import bill and lowering the import bill for a number of things, it's because we recognize that as a country, we actually have the capacity to do it ourselves. And so we can do them ourselves. Um, in general now, when we look at our exports, the main things that we export are our agricultural products. So banana, citrus, coffee, cocoa, and pimento, those are the main, main agricultural products that we export. And in 2019, we exported less in value. We exported the equivalent of 16, this would be 16 million US dollars that we exported um, relative to, to 20, 2018. And we also had declines in, in exporting of our mining and quarrying and crude materials, and that's because we, you know, we had the closure of one of the bauxite plants, etc. Exports for other food in general, it, it's not really big. We have pumpkin, we have ackee, we export a lot of things. The table is very large. We actually export more than you would even realize. We export, you know, we add in mangoes. There's so many things that we export, but what we're exporting is quoted in US thousand dollars. Well, what we're importing is quoted in US million dollars. So just to show how, how, how different it is, there's this huge disparity in what we're exporting. And it's not that we, we want to send away all our food, right? Because when we balance it, we're exporting X amount and we still have this large import um, bill because a lot of the food we're importing, we go to the supermarkets and we're seeing a lot of foreign products and foreign food. And interestingly enough, there are some Jamaican locally produced products that we still don't have enough of 
and so you have agencies like SRC that are working to, you know, to fight the the disease, build disease resistant plants so that we can we can have more um, of our products being grown and you know more, more not as susceptible to diseases. And of course, we have one of the major issues in Jamaica is perennial larceny when we look at our growing our own food here. So there are a number of different factors. But we continue to, to pray that, you know, we can get, go into the supermarket and see more, you know, made in Jamaica than uh, otherwise. And aside from food, there are so many other things that we can make here. We have some very bright and brilliant people and we can look into that. All right. So in general, the outlook for 2020, the PIOJ has reported that real GDP for the the economy contracted by an estimated 18% from April to June, and that is because of COVID-19. Um, so this external shock, this pandemic, will pose a significant threat to an economy that has finally begun to enjoy the benefits of macroeconomic stability. We really don't, we really won't realize just how much we have been set back by the pandemic until a little later on, but we're already seeing the impacts and uh, particularly the hotels and restaurants industry. Now there are about there are a couple thousands of people who are employed to this industry. And so they're going to be negatively impacted and they are negatively impacted. And uh, that is, although it is, we, we're not reliant on tourism, like for about 80% or so, it is still going to cause an impact overall and everything. And we've seen delivery of products and services are affected by physical distancing and curfew guidelines. So we really don't know what uh, the figures will look like next year. And, uh, you know, if the Lord spares our lives to see it, but there will definitely be some impact. And so we continue to pray that we will have enough of a cushion to keep us and to sustain us during this difficult time. All right. So before I get there. All right, so let me ask a question to kind of, you know, get somebody talking back to me so I don't feel so lonely. All right, so last year we, we mentioned, when I did this presentation, I asked the question if Jamaica's population is increasing or decreasing. If you were at that presentation, please don't answer. And for someone else who wasn't at the, the presentation, can you tell me what do you believe Jamaica's population is right now? What do you think our population is? How many persons live in Jamaica? Don't be shy. Don't leave me hanging. It's decreasing. Okay, Sister Prudence says it's decreasing. All right. Sister, Sister Shirley says 2.8 million. Okay. I know that. <laughs> or anyone else? What you think? Uh, somebody says four million. <laughs> I like that from Sister Barnes a lot. And and do you think? Okay, the shorter says that it is increasing. All right, all right. Thank you, thank you. Two point nine million, brother Damien says. Okay. All right. So let's look at what the data shows. Well, let's start by looking at disaggregation by sex. So it showed that females for 2019 females represented 50.5 of the total population, while males accounted for 49.5%. Now, interestingly enough, since 1994, females have been, um, we've had more females in Jamaica than we have had males. But it's, I mean, 50.5 versus 49.5, a couple thousands. Data from RGD, oh, Sister Shirley works at RGD. That's why she's so knowledgeable. Data from the RGD recorded births at 34,500 and deaths at 18,200 for 2019. So 18,200 people died last year. 34,500 people were born last year, uh, resulting in a natural increase of 16,300. Net external movements, so this is persons that are leaving, um, of the population accounted for 17,000. So all of this together means that we actually had a net loss in our population number of 700. 
Now, Jamaica's population average annual rate of growth was estimated at 0% in 2019. Since 2017, the population has not grown. It has been at zero. When we compare it to 1994, births and deaths were estimated at 59,200 for 100,000 people, no, sorry, 59,200 and 13,500 respectively. And that resulted in a natural increase of 45,700. That was in 1994. Now the rate of natural increase declined from 18.6 persons per 100, per 1,000 of the population to six persons per 1,000 over the period 1994 to 2019. So there has been a decline of 64% in the rate at which we're increasing, not in the population, but in the rate at which we're increasing. And this reduction signifies a decline in fertility rates. And this is one of the main determinants of population aging. So essentially what all of this is to, is to say is that the population, we've, we've basically been stalled from 2017. We were having a very slow, slow growth. And since 2017, we have not been growing, we've actually been losing. Now, this, these are some figures. Um, the geography students will know about the population pyramid. And so 2018, they didn't do one for 2019. So for 2018, you can see that the majority of the population is within this age group here. And that's why the pyramid is bulky here. So 20 to 24, 25 to 29, 15 to 19. It's projected that if we continue at this rate of uh, decline, a declining population uh, with a net loss on, an, on a yearly basis, it's projected that in 2030, we're going, to, we're going to see less across all categories and uh, there will be more persons in the aging category. So Jamaica is on its way uh, to becoming an aging population. Well, uh, Sister K is saying that so many persons don't have a birth paper. I mean, they have fraudulent birth paper, right? Well, there is that, but you see, that is a, that's a very small number. It's very minor in the grand scheme of things. And here's the next thing. So although they, they might not have a birth paper, we know through the hospital how many persons are born. And the, 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 the few persons who are, who, you know, never registered their birth, it's not, it's not a very large number that would impact the overall number, right? Probably a couple, Sister, Sister Shirley might have some, some information to share. Yeah, it's really very few. It's really very few. So it's, it's not difficult for us to know because it's not like back in the day where a lot of persons were being born at home. That doesn't happen on a very re regular occasion. Uh, most persons are born in an institution. So that birth would be recorded as, as a birth. Um, but in general, there are less persons that are being born. So it's a good point that you raised, Sister K, but the numbers, the numbers are, wouldn't be that great to affect the, the whole scheme of things. Um, yes, and very good point, sis, Sister or Brother Fergie, I'm not sure. Increase in technology and increase in medicine, people are living longer. So if we look at the, the data on screen, it's showing from 2015 to 2019, the population at the end of the year, you can see it was 2727 down to 2726. Um, you can see the live births, you know, kind of fluctuating and the deaths. So the deaths are decreasing. We actually have had less persons dying year on year. So although yes, things look so terrible, like, like everybody are dead from cancer and everybody are dead from accident and whatever, we've actually had less persons dying year on year for the last couple of years as well. So we have more persons that are living longer. And this is balanced by the, um, the fact that the birth rate is declining. So as you can see here, the low population growth rate, 2015, just 0 0.2, 0 0.1, and then zero, zero, zero. And just to show it graphically as well. So from 2005, see, birth rate is declining, rate of natural increase, overall decline, death rate, uh, almost about the same. Now, the total fertility rate declined from 4.5 births per woman. So in the 70s, on average, a woman, woman would have 4.5 children. Yeah, I know you can't have 0.5 of a child. <laughs> that's how data is. Um, and currently, it's 2.4 
um, births per woman. Now, the aim of Jamaica is to have a fertility rate of 2.1 births per woman um, at, uh, by 2030. So the country actually is welcoming persons having less children. Uh, then that would, would help to, to lessen the burden on the economy and, and all, man, all manner of things. But it's not, that, it's not that we want persons to stop having children because we have to, we have to be fruitful and multiply. Amen. <laughs> all right. So any, any, before I move on to labor force, any questions or comments on that? Yeah, good point, Sister Short. I just mentioned that they're registered from the hospital. Right. Yes. And that's a very good point. So in some countries, as someone is saying in the chat, for example, Japan has a serious issue with an aging population. They're encouraging people to have children. I remember I read somewhere that one of the ministers there in government said that young people are too busy playing games instead of playing in the bedroom. And he was saying, you know, you need to go and have children. But the more persons become career driven, uh, there are some persons that they say the only child that they'll ever have is a pet. They, they're not really, there's a lot of focus more on career, on living their lives. On, I have a friend and, um, and she said to me after she got married, she said she has no interest in having children because she can't see herself changing diapers and all of that you know, stinky stuff. And she wants to travel with her husband and you know, live the life. Fast forward two years later, and <laughs> she has she actually has a child, and she's very happy, um, of course, because a child brings happiness. So you know, but but that was her her way of thinking beforehand, and so it's it's actually a trend overall. It interestingly enough in in lower income settings, lower income communities, uh, that tends to be where where there. Where, where you continue to see a large number of children being born. And so one of the indicators for advancement that the world considers is having less children because having less children means having less mouths to feed, you know, having less of that burden. So it really is a global, a global shift that some persons, uh, that a lot of countries, most countries are, are going through right now. All right, so let's look at the labor force. Now, labor force, we had it averaged 1,349,000. This was an increase over 2018. And interestingly enough, the male labor force, well, not surprising, remained stable as it continued to account for 53.9%. So of all the persons that are employed in Jamaica, 53.9% are males. And there was an overall increase of both sexes in the labor force, but the higher percentage still held by the males. Now the persons in the prime working age group and the prime working age group is 25 to 54 years. So if you're in that age group, yay, you're prime. <laughs> and the persons in that age group alone, 25 to 54 years accounted for 69% of the total labor force. While 26.4% of the total labor force was in the 25 to 34 years age group. Now, if we look at um, employment status, the uh, non-government employees account for the, the, the highest number in terms of um, num the th thousands of people that are employed. As you can see here, the figures are particularly high. Uh, government employees like myself, we know really there's so much, no way. Um, we have unpaid workers, employers. So this just shows you know, how the labor force is, uh, is segmented. So we still have the men who are leading in this and uh, that's okay, no matter to me. <laughs> All right, so looking at, oh, there's a question. Yes, let me go back to labor force. Go ahead, Brother Rahim. All right, um, just so that I am uh, up to date, you can like, explain the persons who are non-government employees, like just some examples. Okay, so that would be like Sister Shani. So she doesn't work for the government. So this would be the private sector. Oh. So, right, yes, yes. So government okay. employees, you know, teachers working in the ministries, police. So once the government is paying a salary. Yeah. yeah. Right. All right, thanks. No problem. Thank you for your question. All right, so we're going to move right on to education and training. Uh, the school age cohort is considered to be three years old to 24 years old. Now, 
for 2019, 534,502 persons were, up, were within this age bracket. And that would be, um, so 77%, no, sorry, 77% of persons in that age bracket were enrolled in educational institutions. So 534,502 persons were enrolled in some kind of education from infant to tertiary. At the infant level, which is three to five years, Males accounted for 50.2% of the student population. At primary level, they accounted for 51.2%. And at secondary level, this is high school level, they accounted for 49.7%. You see there is a little decline, decline here. Um, but then interestingly enough, if you recall, we do have more females in the population than males. Uh, also, what is interesting though, is that at the high school level, when we look at those who are registered to sit CSEC exams, 55.4% of those registered were females. And we have seen in, in, in looking at data, we've seen where a number of, in a lot of cases, it's about equal for enrollment, male and female. But when it comes to being registered to sit the CSEC exams, we're seeing a falling off where a number of young men are not registering to sit CSEC exams, which means that they're not going to be doing the exams to get that, that certification. So that, that is something that bears looking at. Why is it that we have uh, less of our boys who are registering um, for these exams when we really should not have, we shouldn't be having a 55.4% registration for females over males when they're, they're not too far off in terms of um, enrollment. Uh, enrollment at the tertiary level was estimated to be 52,267 students. And another point of concern, and this has been a trend for a number of years, is that in ter at tertiary level, 64.7% uh, of persons who are enrolled at this higher education are females. And uh, compare this to compare this to 2018. Um, where it was 69%. Actually, no, Sister Jenny, the, the more females than males in the population overall doesn't, it's not the key, the key issue for the, the, the enrollment um, problem that we're seeing. Because when you, when you look at the data, you're looking at for a particular school, you have enrollment at uh, almost one-to-one. -one. But then the same student, the, the same cohort, within the same cohort, when it comes to registering for the exams, you have more females registering than the males. Uh, for the tertiary level, remember the, the population is what? 50 point something percent females, 49 point something percent males. But we have 64.7% of all the students at tertiary level. And this isn't just UA, this is tertiary, all tertiary institutions across the country, 64.7% are female. So this has been a point of concern. For UA alone, it's 69%. Uh, if you look at the pie chart here, you would see that, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, primary and secondary, that's where most of our, our students are enrolled. So you persons will say, okay, so we look at the tertiary issue and we would say, okay, so a lot of the young men are not going to universities, but they might be doing training programs and you know those kind of programs where they can build up themselves through heart and etc cetera, etc cetera. but then we look now at the enrollment and output of skilled and semi-skilled manpower from non-formal human development and resource training so these are the agent the, the training agency programs now and uh, the you know you think that okay since we didn't see them in the tertiary system, maybe they're in these training agencies. But if you look at the data for 2018 to 2019, and this is enrollment first, there are more females enrolled in these programs than there were males. So these are persons that started the programs in 2018 to 19. Uh, construction, unsurprisingly, construction had uh, the high, higher number for males. And this, this, this in particular interested me, ICT, this is Information and Communications Technology. So this is a tech stuff. And there were more females enrolled in ICT programs at these training agencies than there were males. The, looking at the output, so 40,000, 58,000 enrollment output, unsurprisingly, you have more 
females graduating and leaving these training agency programs than you do males. So there is a, a cause for concern because if, uh, if you are not, if you're not at the tertiary and then the training, which is where you would expect to see, okay, maybe they're in these training programs. We have the females that are, are outweighing the males in these training programs. And so this is a cause for concern because what we what we ideally want to see is something that is closer in ratio. We don't want to see this huge disparity. Um, I I had to put this in again. I had it last uh, last year. So if you recall, the labor force there are more men employed than there are women in Jamaica. But if we look at the the output based on occupation. These are our teachers, our doctors, our radiographers, our lab techs, our physiotherapists, our dentists, our accountants, our managers, economists, social scientists, these kind of people. So these are the professional areas now. And look at the, the disparity between what we're seeing for female. This is data from 2018. Unfortunately, the ESSJ didn't put it in for 2019, but it's probably not going to be very different. So we're seeing we are graduating a lot more teachers, a um, lot more female in terms of teachers, doctors, nurses, kind of, everybody kind of expect that here. But the technical professions, the graduates from these are the females. And uh, engineering, architecture, land surveying, computer technician, programmer, engineers in general, logistics. Well, logistics isn't even that far off the male versus female is really where you're seeing more males than females. So in general, the, the output we're getting, so the labor force might be more men than women, but when we look at the area of professionalism, who are the professionals, who are, look at the, the data for attorneys, 86 male attorneys versus 139 females. So who are the attorneys? Who are the, the physiotherapists? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, female power, down with the men. No, <laughs> that's not the point. We want, we want to see things more, a lot more balanced. And Jamaica has the, Jamaica is actually on top for the, 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 the leader in the world for um, female bosses. So the likelihood of you having a supervisor that is a lady it's the highest in Jamaica than anywhere else in the world. There was actually a study done. So, so there is a point of concern because we are not seeing, we're not getting that professional kind of, you know, push from that we would expect to see from our men. And then on the flip side, we still have right now, we still have more men in a lot of the boardrooms. But as you can see, there is clearly a shift because eventually, if, if, if nothing is, is done, what's going to happen is you're going to have less to pick from the professional pool to put them in the boardroom. So that is something for our brotherhood's president to think about. All right, so let's switch from that. Any, any comments or questions before I move on? Have I lost anybody? Okay, all right, so let's move on. So let's look at health. What are we doing in terms of health? How are we doing? Um, as I mentioned before, we're living longer as reflected by a low crude death rate and improve the standard of living. Average life expectancy at birth is 74.2 years. Average life expectancy for a man is 70.4 years old, and for a lady, it's 78 years. Bible says three score and 10. Um, you know, the men are there at almost on the dot with three score and 10. You know, and if by virtue of, you know, some grace and some mercy, you might add on another 10. And the lady is going through to add on an extent <laughs> at 78. Uh, from the survey on living conditions in 2017, approximately 25% uh, of Jamaicans reported having at least one chronic illness. And hypertension remains the non communicable disease with the highest proportion, 13.2%. So we have a lot of persons suffering from hypertension. Oh, one moment. All right, so looking at data from public hospitals, unfortunately, for some reason, they didn't get the data from UWE uh, for 2019. Not sure what happened there. Um, but the data from the hospitals showed that across the island, violence-related injuries, respiratory diseases, and gastroenteritis added to the public health burden in Jamaica. 
So some injuries are classified as unintentional. These would be accidents, et cetera. And 28.8% of patients seen in our hospitals was for unintentional injuries. 7.3% would be intentional. And we'll get more into that in the other slides. Now, this was very interesting. Other emergencies, there's a category called other emergencies. And other emergencies accounted for 63.9% of all patients seen in 2019. What are these other emergencies? These are upper and lower respiratory tract infections, asthma, and gastroenteritis. So the main reasons that persons were visiting the emergency room, the hospital, was as a result of these. Upper and lower respiratory tract infections, asthma, and gastroenteritis. 37% of the patients with these conditions that went to the hospital were under five years old. So these are all babies. And when we look at, you know, under 10 years old on a whole, 54.3% of all patients presenting with these conditions were under 10 years old. So a lot of our children are affected by respiratory tract infections, asthma, and asthma primarily, gastroenteritis, uh, not, as, as, um, not as serious. I am not sure why this is. Some persons say that air quality is just too terrible. Um, but we, but this, is, this is a very concerning point because this is the main reason that we're, we're seeing patients at the hospitals. Now, of all those seen in hospitals, males accounted for 56.5%. And we'll get more into why that is. All right, so this is showing the number of patients seen, unintentional injuries. You can see the males outweigh the females. Um, intentional injuries, the same, and other emergencies way up here. Uh, I put this point over here in red um, that when we look at suicide attempts, which are in intentional injuries, there were 260 suicide attempts in 2019. And these are reported for, for persons as low as the five to nine age group. Of the 260 suicide attempts, females accounted for 66.2% of all these attempts at committing suicide. So 172 females attempted suicide and presented at the hospital. And of that 172 females, 57.6% were in the 10 to 19 age group. These are our teenagers. 19.8% were in the 20 to 29 age group. So our young people, it's in the young people age group that we're finding the highest cases of attempted suicide. Overall, when we look at both male and females, 47.3% of those that attempted suicide belong to the 10 to 19 age group. Now this age group alone is only 16.3% of the population. So there, and these are, these are the cases that, that go, that present to the hospital. These are, these aren't the cases that we, and I, I remember also, you know, that UE is not, ex, it's not included in this data because they didn't get the data for them. So we don't know how many got to the UE hospital, but this has been the trend uh, for the last three years. I've been doing this presentation where of all the attempted suicide cases, most of these are females and most are in the 10 to 19 age group. All right, so let's look at unintentional injuries. And we can see these are the different categories, burns, poisoning, motor vehicle accidents, accidental lacerations, bites, and falls. So uh, bites, yeah. So when people are talking about dog bite and for the dog, and so it's a real thing. We have far too, I think we have far too many cases of, of people being bitten. Um, point to note here, this is very, very long bar. It's very long bar for motor vehicle accidents. Uh, it's important to note that there are more patients seen for motor vehicle accidents. We saw 14,047 patients in 2019 for motor vehicle accidents. There are more patients seen for motor vehicle accidents than there are for the entire intentional injuries category that we're going to get afterwards. This is, this is a serious public emergency concern. We have far too many persons. We, we report on the deaths on an, on an annual basis. Um, it's in the news a lot over, I think we got to over 400 
um, in 2019 are almost 400. But we, aside from that, there are persons that are, are living, their, their lives have been so severely impacted. They're paralyzed. They have lost income. They, they have lost so much because they've, they've been injured in motor vehicle accidents. And the fact that we had 14,047 persons Entering, in our, entering our hospitals because of motor vehicle accidents is a serious issue. And we can see where the majority of these were the males. Same with accidental lacerations, same with bites, same with falls. Um, a number of you know, men work on very high places on roofs, et cetera. Um, you know, people falling down the stairs. So these are unintentional injuries. And these are the reasons that we are seeing uh, persons presenting to our hospital. For intentional injuries now, so someone has an intent to do and they go and they do. So intentional lacerations, and you can see a trend here. Intentional lacerations, look at the blue bar. Stab wounds, look at the blue bar. Gunshot, look at the blue bar. Blunt injury, look at the blue bar. The only, the only two areas where the males do not to outnumber the females is in attempted suicide, which I, I looked at a while ago, and sexual assault. So when we say that the, the issue of crime is adding to our pub, the burden of our public health system, this is what we're talking about. When we have so many men, so many women coming into our hospitals because of these intentional injuries, right? And just to look at sexual assault, to pull that out, 825 patients were seen for sexual assault. And this was across all age groups from zero to over 65. 44 of these patients were under five years old. 77 of these patients were in the five to nine years old bracket. 772 of these patients were females. And 61.1% of the females who were sexually assaulted belong to the 10 to 19 age group. So our young ladies are being targeted. Our young ladies are, the, the issue of sexual assault is real. And it is something that we see so often in our news. And the sad reality is that so many persons, there are so many persons, I think probably everyone in this room knows at least one person that has been sexually assaulted at some point. And these are the, the ones that presented at hospital. There are so many other cases where it's hidden, where nobody knows what is happening because they haven't spoken about it. And the 10 to 19 years age group is being affected. Very good point, as someone is making in the chat. Men are afraid to report when they are sexually assaulted because it feels so, it's such a, it's, it's so, they feel so, you know, I, I, I read a story of um, um, a man who was sexually assaulted while he was on a jog. It was overseas. And he shared anonymously online because he said he feels so ashamed and he feels so much less of a man. He couldn't even tell his wife what happened to him because he just felt so ashamed. So he, it was this anonymous platform where he could, he could use to just pour out what is happening to him. So you are right, a, a, a number of men who are sexually assaulted do not, um, you know, would not go to the hospital or so. Uh, so the intentional injuries, we, we saw before that most men, most patients that are seen in our hospitals are men. And this is part of the reason because for both intentional and unintentional, there are more males being affected across the categories. All right, so let's look at what's killing us. <laughs> or rather, why are we dying? Um, so illnesses from cancers, hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases remain the leading causes of mortality and morbidity. In 2019, the leading cause of death for women were diabetes, cerebrovascular diseases, so this would be like stroke, and hypertensive diseases. For men, the predominant causes were external causes, and we can understand, we just looked at some of those. So external causes would be like accidents and intentional, um, intentional activities like violence, cerebrovascular diseases, and diabetes. Uh, the data over here is, actually doesn't have 2019. 
it has 20 from 2015 to 2017 and it's 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 not too far off um, based on the report they say the the trend is similar where men are mostly dying by external causes and then there are cerebrovascular diseases like strokes and diabetes prostate cancer heart disease hypertension hiv and for the ladies diabetes is the leading cause of death uh, cerebrovascular disease is stroke hypertension is third and then heart diseases etc the, the the cancer here is breast cancer so the leading cancer leading cause of death by cancer in jamaica is breast cancer for ladies and the prostate cancer for men so when when we are being told as ladies to go and get screened when men you're being told to go and get screened it is very important uh, because you don't need to become part of the statistic hiv i'm still surprised that hiv is on the the list because we have access globally there is access and the medication is working so well so persons just need to take their medication and they will be able to live a normal life even with hiv it's no longer a death sentence as you can clearly see the death sentence is actually diabetes and cerebrovascular diseases these are very serious health conditions and a lot of persons don't fully understand what how much of an impact and how much of a change these diseases diabetes in particular does to your body it is very very dangerous it is deadly and uh, uh, i think i should probably prepare a presentation on that because when you look at diabetes at the biochemical level at what it does to your body what it does to the inside it is amazing how terrible this disease is but it is a lot of persons don't fully understand it and so that's why we continue to do some of the things that we do uh, not not realizing that we're putting ourselves at risk uh, if we live healthy lives we don't need to become diagnosed with type 2 diabetes we can live healthy lives do what we need to do and keep it at bay amen all right um 58 suicides were reported in 2019 87.9 percent were men now this is a general trend the general trend is that we have more ladies attempting suicide but the ones that are successful at the suicide are the men. Um, someone said, you know, a number of men have access to more devices or more lethal methods. Uh, however, hanging was the most common method used. 75.9% uh, of the suicides that happened in 2019 happened by hanging. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, more women are attempting suicide, but more men are being successful. We don't want anybody to be attempting and we surely don't want anybody. This is not a competition for who can be successful. That is for sure. Uh, suicide is a very serious issue and it's something that we need to continue to pray about and work with persons. When we see that they're showing suicidal tendencies, let us work with them and help to counsel them. Um, especially for our young persons. We saw the data before, how many are attempting in the young age group. We have to be more present and present ourselves so that they can have this opportunity to come and speak with us, for us to give counseling, for us to help them through these difficult times. All right, so let me take another sip of water. All right, so national security. Uh, yes, Sister K. Oh, Sister K has a very good point. She's asking, is it that we as Jamaicans are not aware of mental illnesses? That's a very good point because I really believe that we, we don't have a good appreciation of mental illness and mental issues. Um, for a lot of Jamaicans, uh, mental illness means that you're on the road dressed terribly and uh, you know, scrunching after food and you're a madman. But a number of persons are having mental issues. But as Fergie says, nobody wants to talk about it because if you say, you know, I'm suffering from a mental issue or um, I'm suffering from depression, it is taboo. Uh, you, you tell your sister that you're feeling depressed and, uh, you know, she says, 
why are you depressed? God is good. <laughs> you know, um, God is good. So you shouldn't be depressed, but that doesn't, that saying you shouldn't be depressed doesn't take away from the fact that the person is indeed depressed. Uh, some persons are afraid to reach out to somebody to talk to them about the issue. There, there's a person that I, I was talking to and they, they weren't really sure if they were depressed and they were wondering who can they talk to to find out if they're depressed because they're not sure if they're depressed. And so depression is just one of many things. Some persons have a lot of different things going on in their mind and they just, they just need that mental health, but they're afraid to talk about it because as Fergie says, it is a uh, taboo um or some in the chat someone is saying that okay some women don't actually want to die in the suicide attempt it's often a last resort or a cry for help and that is true that is true some person some persons don't actually want to die they cut themselves or they do something because they they just want somebody to pay attention to them um so that is indeed true and someone is mentioning that um, men use different methods from women when they are, you know, when they're actually ready to commit suicide. Uh, yeah, so that might be it. Okay, awareness of depression. Yes, yes, there, there is. Thank you. This Fergie is Ferguson. This is Ferguson. I'm, I'm getting the feeling that Fergie is Ferguson. <laughs> okay. Um, Sister Antoinette mentioned that some persons say she's antisocial and that it's okay, but as far as she's concerned, it is not. And there are so, this would be, this would, to talk about depression and mental health would be a whole other discussion, but it is indeed a very important thing that we have to be aware of. And I think sometimes as Christians, we feel like it is not okay to vocalize these problems that we're having because Oh, you're saying not you, Anthony. You're not antisocial. Okay, no problem. I got you. I got you. <laughs> um, some persons as Christians feel it is, it, they can't vocalize this issue. They, they can't vocalize the fact that they're struggling mentally, uh, that they believe they're mentally ill. But, and, you know, it's interesting because we talk a lot of, we, we are so quick to talk about our physical illness. My knee hurts, my stomach hurts, my head hurts. But when it comes to talking about a mental illness, because the taboo is that it means you're crazy and you're mad, and that's not necessarily the case at all. Um, it just means that just like how your stomach isn't working so well, you know, it, your mind is just at a place right now where it just needs some, it needs some healing, it needs some help, and we need somebody to help you through that. So that would be a whole other discussion, but we really need to be more, more, emotionally sensitive to persons who are experiencing mental issues without thinking that it is that they're crazy right um understanding that these are issues that can be dealt with and a lot of times they just need someone to talk to to help them to release some of that anxiety because anxiety is a, is a mental that's a mental issue right there you know that's a type of illness anxiety having panic attacks i suffered from panic attacks when i was in sixth form i had to get to, I, I had to i was going to a doctor and she was helping me to the breathing exercises and panic attacks that's a form of a mental illness because my mind was just not healthy you know so suffering from panic attacks suffering from anxiety attacks so there's so there, there it's just such a a, a wide um there are so many different facets to it that we'd really have to look into, but we need to be more cognizant of it and to help persons through because this is what leads to when unchecked, when, when, when no one intervenes, this is why we have these suicide attempts. This is why we have these suicides actually taking place. So thank you for those points. Yes, Sister Janiel. So uh, my friend, she's currently a medical social worker. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was a couple of years ago during World Mental Health Day, she posted something and she actually asked me and she said, how is your mental health? So when she asked it, I was like, huh, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. And she was just sharing with me that, you know, today's World Mental Illness Day or Mental Health Day. I don't remember which one it is. And 
you know, we should really take the time to ask persons how is their mental health or how are their mental health. Right. And I took her up on it and I reached out to some persons and I said, how is your mental health? And the, some of the responses that I got was very shocking. And yes. the persons that I didn't know that, you know, they struggled with certain things, they were just sharing. And another the person said to me, you know, thank you for asking because they were just going through a lot and they didn't really think anybody cared. Mm -hmm. And I was there and I was like, oh my goodness. You know, it, and it made me become more aware of what other person and not just on the outside but what they may be going through and not just you know taking an outward look for granted very good thank you thank you so much for that and it's true you ask someone All right, bless the Lord. Can you hear me, anyone? Yes, Pastor, we're hearing you. Yes, Pastor. Oh, okay. Oh, she's back. I'm back, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, and I was just reading what Sister Kenisha said in the chat, and it was so, it was so important. Oh, my yeah, goodness. Um, all right, so, yeah, so Sister Kenisha was saying, if I remember correctly, that, you know, we just need to be more aware as a church and um, to give a listening ear. And then someone was, else was saying that as a church, we need to be more aware and uh, uh, more sensitive. So yeah, so again, that will be a discussion that we can, we, we need to delve more into and uh, let's look at it. Let's look at it. So I'll consider that and uh, with, I'll, I'll draw on Sister Keshana. <laughs> to help me with that angle. Well, thank you so much for your points. All right, let's move on to matters of national security, an area that is dear to my heart. Okay, so you're, everyone is seeing the screen? No green, right? Yes, okay. it's okay. You can okay. see. All right, great. All right, so in 2019, the total number of reported crimes increased by 4.5% to 17,066. So this is crimes. So we had 17,066 crimes reported. Don't know how many weren't reported. Despite the increase, um, this was still the second lowest figure recorded over the five-year period from, from 2015 to 2019. All right, so overall, crime rate increased to 626 per 100,000 people. So for every 100,000 people, 626 crimes were committed. That's, that's a statistical way of, of allowing us to compare to other countries. Um, this was up from 599 in 2018. Now, Jamaica has the 11th highest crime rate in the world. How many countries in the world? 198, 200. And we have the 11th highest crime rate in the world. Now, war-torn Syria is at number 10. I'm sure persons have seen the images coming out of Syria. Bombs are dropping. They're having raids, just going in and shooting up people. And Syria is number 10. We're number 11. Um, our neighbor, Trinidad and Tobago, is at number 6. Now, this is the crime rate. Crime rate, right? I don't get to murder rate yet. Now, firearms continue to be the main weapon used to commit murders, while knives account for 6.2%. So firearms, 83.6%. Knives, 6.2%. Machetes, machetes. Somebody said online that their, their daughter pronounced the, the last E in machete, um, and they were shocked, uh, wondering if the person is really Jamaican. And then I just said machete. <laughs> machetes for 2.3%. Gun and knife, 0.2, 7.7% for other stuff. Uh, so firearms continue to be uh, the bane of our existence. We've, we've heard of 
a barrel of hundreds of firearms being found and you just wonder how many more barrels were not found which is one of the reasons saints you see when when it comes to praying about uh, when it comes to praying about um about crime and the crime issue we have to be so specific in how we pray one of the things that i i always pray for is our borders these firearms are coming through our borders. Everything that comes into, we don't, we don't make guns. We don't make AK-47s and whatever the other guns are called. I don't know. I don't know what they're called. Um, we don't make those. They're coming in. So when we pray, we have to pray that our borders are sealed, that whoever is allowing these things to come in, that it stops, that um, however it's bypassing, our border security that it stops because if we can stop the guns from coming in we can significantly significantly impact the number of uh, murders that are committed right and so firearms continue to be the main the main weapon now in terms of missing 2221 persons were reported missing in 2019 i followed the 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 cda and um, some other child development agencies, uh, child agencies on Twitter. And so it's so sad how every week we keep seeing these posters of missing children. Of the 2,221 persons that were reported missing, 70% were children. And of the 2,221, 65.4% were females. So the children and ladies are normally um, the highest in terms of missing. Now, thankfully, by year end, 1,438 had returned. Whether it be that then they just run off and come back, whatever the case is, they return. 42 were confirmed dead. 11.9% of that number were children. But we ended the year with 741 still missing. This is a very large number. This is a very large number. So 741 were still missing at the end of 2019. Of that number, 62.3% children. Now let's look at total crimes that were reported. 2018 and 2019. Um, all of these are the categories under which they, you know, they, how they categorize the crimes. 62.4% of crimes committed were cleared up. Interestingly enough, because it don't seem that way, <laughs> but it depends on what crime you're looking at. And this is a decline from 2018. 72.2% of crimes were cleared up. Murders and shootings, though, continue to show a low clearance rate. And this is, this is where it's interesting because, you know, you would say, oh, yeah, 62.4% cleared up. But then what matters the most to a number of us is the the crimes that result in in deaths that the deaths of our our loved ones our family our friends and so murders and shootings if we look at 2018 1287 reported 658 cleared up 2019 1332 reported 335 cleared up so the murders are happening but the the perpetrators are not being found. Uh, persons are not going to court for these cases. It's just, there are just so many families out there who lost loved ones to murder and they have no idea who did it. So they don't even have that sense of closure to say, okay, the person is behind bars. And from 2015 to 2019, over that stretch of period, only 39% of the 6,821 murders that were committed have been cleared up. And only 32.2% of the 6,175 shootings have been cleared up. Let that sink in. From 2015 to 2019, 6,821 people were murdered. And there were shooting incidents 6,175 times. This is not okay by any stretch of the imagination. Of the 23 categories of crimes recorded, there was an increase in the number for 16 categories. So all these categories here from 2018 to 2019, the number of reported cases increased. We only saw declines in a few like arson, assault, predial larceny, and so on. 
Now, Category 1 crimes include murder, shooting, rape, aggravated assault, robbery, breaking, and larceny. So they, they, they take out the worst crimes, essentially. Um, there was a 6.4 increase in this category, a 221 per 100,000 up from 208 per 100,000 in 2018. Approximately one-fifth of these crimes occur in the parish of St. Andrew. We have 14 parishes, one-fifth of category one crimes happening in St. Andrew. They arrested 13,144 persons in 2019. 19.9% 19 .9 of those arrested were arrested for category one crimes. Now, it doesn't mean that the crime they were arrested for took place in 2019. It's just that they happened to be arrested that year. 96.8% were males. And of all those in that um, category, 45.8% were in the 15 to 24 years age group. 308 children, those under 18, were arrested for category one crimes. Now we saw a decline in 2018, but unfortunately murders increased in 2019, although it still remained lower than 2016 and 2017. The murder rate for 2019 was 49 per 100,000. We were, okay. I, I was handed a note, but I can't read anything on it. <laughs> Send me a message, please. <laughs> Um, so we were ranked number two in the world in 2017. 2017, we had 57 murders per 100,000. And we were ranked number two. I don't know where we rank now because they haven't done a, a re-ranking as yet. Um, but when persons talk about us being the murder capital of the world, fortunately, we're not there because we're behind El Salvador. Um, but I mean, this is really something to be fortunate about, right? We still rank within the top five for highest murder rate. I don't know what the revised number will show for 2018 and 19, but this is still way too high. Um, just looking at just looking at some of the, the, the other countries, for example, if we pick a country, pick any country, Cuba, Cuba murder rate, five murders per 100,000 of the population. So five murders per 100,000, and we're at 49. So it is way too high. And this is, this is a cause for concern and something that we continue to, something that we continue to pray about, something that we continue to do whatever we can as a people to control. Uh, looking at it by parish, so we can see from the red lines which parishes are, are leading the pack. Kingston, St. Andrew, and St. Catherine. St. Andrew, which we mentioned before. So murder, shooting, rape, aggravated assault, robbery, breaking, larceny. We see the high numbers. Of all the murders that occurred in 2019, 75% were in St. James, St. Catherine, St. Andrew, Clarendon, and Kingston. Uh, this continues to be interesting year on year. The age and sex of persons arrested for category one crime. So these are those that are arrested. So let's look at that first. 96.8% males. And we can see the age bracket. 18 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44. So this is the age group in which the perpetrators, this is the main age group for the perpetrators right here in this young category. And we come over now to the age group and sex of the victims. So who are the victims that are being affected here? And it's the same thing. So not only are, not only is the young age group perpetuating the crimes, category one crimes, but the young age group is also the victim of these crimes. So 18 to 24, 25 to 34. These are the persons who are most impacted by these acts of violence in category one. And, and just to note that we had 6,815 victims in 2018, and we had more victims in 2019, 7,122. 66.6% .6 of the victims are males. So the males perpetuating, the males being victimized, uh, that is the, what the data shows. All right, so look at who is in our prison system. 
males accounted for 97.1% of adults in custody at the end of 2019. Now you see how all of this is kind of tying into what we were seeing earlier when we think about it. We have, uh, we have so many, we have less males in the, the professional areas, less males being registered. When we look at the data showing that young people are perpetuating crime, young males are perpetuating crimes. We know of young men being in, in, um, in gangs, gang-related activities and so on. So, so, so we're not seeing them registering for CSEC. We're not seeing them at the training agencies. We're not seeing them in the tertiary institutions. Where are they? Where are they? And what can we do individually, collectively, to stop more of them from getting into the things that they should not be getting into? Now, look at this, what this pie chart is showing. When you look at admission to correctional centers, 47.3% of those admitted to correctional centers were unskilled. No skill, Not, probably the streets grew then. 38.5% of them self-employed. It's interesting because I, and sometimes this is the news and someone's arrested and they say, oh, a self-employed businessman, what, <laughs> what is that businessman? You don't even know what kind of business him have, you know? If him just selling something random on the street side, maybe selling ganja was his idea of a business. But look at the professional and the skilled categories. So when persons talk about, you know, try, try and, and from an early age, really instill that, that value and, and, and put things in place to help persons to elevate themselves in society, to become skilled, get a skill, you know, be, become a, co a contributing member to society. You know, that these are, these are social interventions that will help to keep persons out of the prison system, right? Out of crime, out of crime. Because this is only those who were caught. There are too, way too many. We saw the clearance rate for murders and shootings. Way too many persons who are still roaming after committing these crimes. The number of persons in the under-17 age group admitted to juvenile institutions uh, was 79 78.5% 78, 78 males, uh, main reasons, larceny, house breaking, uncontrollable behavior, etc. So we'll look more into that. Uh, so this is the data for our juveniles. And interestingly enough, when we look at the areas that are underlined. So these are reasons juveniles appear before the court. We, you know, there is a presumption of innocence, so we can't assume that they're all guilty. But they appeared before the court primarily for sexual offenses, robbery, wounding, breaching of the firearm law, armed with offensive weapon shooting with intent. Uh, these two here, uncontrollable behavior and care and protection are child abuse are, you know, social issues. Uh, I was actually surprised to find out recently how many persons, how many children are in the state state centers because their parents can't control them. So pastor decides that him can't control Ruthann and he carries her to court until the court same don't want her anymore. Uh, I, I find that very interesting, you know, and then the court will place them in these centers and a, a lot of times they, they come out worse than before. So these are so these are these are some of the reasons. But what, what we're focusing on is the, the crime that are we see happening with our juveniles. And these this is a cause for concern. Uh, before I move on to the very last thing, anyone has any comments? Okay. I hope you haven't all uh, fallen asleep. <laughs> all right, so just to wrap up, um, you know, I, was, I didn't think I, I, I could end it without, you know, at least sharing some information on what's happening with the pandemic. Uh, total cases as of today, uh, 6,017, deaths 89, active cases 4,153, critically ill 6, moderately ill 25, hospitalized 117. And for the active cases, we can see where Kingston and St. Andrew has the highest number. And it's listed here um, based on who is who has the most number of cases. And we can see you know, from Kingston and St. Andrew at the top to Hanover at the bottom. So the, the pandemic is still very much with us. 
And so far we're seeing, uh, well, this is based on Saturday's data, uh, as in Friday's data rather, uh, females account for 54.4% of all cases, males for 51.1%. 80.6% of confirmed cases are under 60 years old. While, oh, wait, no, sorry. Males account for 51.1% of all the deaths reported uh, that were reported up to Friday. 80.6% uh, of confirmed cases are under 60 years old, yet 67% of those deceased are from the 60 and over age group. So if you look at the, the chart here, confirmed by age group, these would be the younger age group, but then look at the deaths. So when the government talks about our older population being impacted, the data shows that. Persons from all age categories, we've lost, we've lost at least one person from all age categories, but the majority of the persons that we're losing um, from COVID-19 are in the 60 and over age brackets with pre-existing conditions uh, primarily. So it's very important that we continue to, to do what we can to protect ourselves, to stay safe. Don't flout the measures. Um, but do what we can to stay safe to protect ourselves in this time so that we can have uh, less deaths we need to we need to, to to we need to we need to protect our parents we need to protect our parents and our grandparents so let's continue to do all that we can and let us continue to pray and pray um and finally we have not updated this chart since 2011 because we haven't done another census as yet. Uh, but just to, to remind us that we fall into this Pentecostal category. And according to the last census, we were only 9.5% of the total um, in terms of denomination. And then this Pentecostal includes all kind of other people that call themselves Pentecostal. So uh, I'm very interested to see what the next census will show. Uh, but we have, a, we have a lot of work to do. Um, we have uh, no, re no religion is, was at 21.3%. We don't know what it is at now. But there is a lot for us to do as a church. And uh, I know I have said a whole lot and there's so many things, so many areas that we touched on as a snapshot. But it's important that we have the information so that we can know how to target our priors. We can have a better appreciation of when we read the news and read certain articles. Uh, so we can, we can have a better understanding. And uh, I can't say it enough, knowing how to target our priors. We have a crisis that is happening right now with crime and violence with our men in particular, our men from the school to skills to being victims to being perpetrators that we need to continue to look at. So what can we do as the church? Yes, we pray, but what can we do as a church to really, yes, what can we do as a church to really help um, help to bring about some change. So it's very important that we look at it, at these issues individually and collectively. So that is all. Anyone has any questions? Thank you, Sister Shirley and Sister Barnes. Anyone has any questions or comments? No, I just updating you when you're talking about women at the UAE. I was just saying, even parliament, you now those are parliament. This is our, since our election, no oh, woman. Oh, my father was saying. You don't have to say your father. I said my father already, and you're the one saying it. <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> and, uh, thank you. He said it so loud, too. Um, yeah, he was just pointing out that we're having more, more women in parliament and in, um, in the Senate. And, and as I mentioned before, if we continue, if the pool of men continue to decline, that professional pool of men continue to decline. We already have more women in the workplace and the professional areas. So naturally it's going to be happening 
at our government level. So, of course, again, I'm not saying that we, we're fighting out the women, the women, you know, but I'm saying, I, well, for me, I want to see more balance in our society. We, we, we already have our men dying, whether unintentional or intentional, or, I mean, they're just so badly affected by so many things. And so something needs to be done. Um, Dr. Z. Yes, Brother Farkasin. Yeah. Yes, so um, um, early on you mentioned about we have 40 something percent men and we have 50 something percent women. For the, for the population? Right. Oh, okay, yes. So, um, not trying to justify anything, but that could be a factor to think about. Well, um, it's. Regarding men enter into certain. Yet, yet, though there is a great shift, we see women in actually all the technical areas populated um, except construction. So I'm here wondering. Well, the thing is, you know, Brother Ferguson, it is so, it is, it's, it's not that much, it's not that big of a difference to cause the great disparity we see. So we, we have, let me go back to the population slide. I have like 500 slides. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's 50.5 versus 49.5. Yeah. It's 50.5 versus 49.5. So it, it, it's, not, it's not that big well, of a it's difference. It's not to justify yeah yeah to justify yeah. The, the huge disparity when we have a tertiary we have six over 60 percent of um almost 70 percent of students at tertiary being being the ladies mm -hmm. so yeah, i guess um the next thing i had on my mind is just seeing what's happening in our homes uh, most of our homes lack men yes so, um, we... a mother cannot grow a young man <laughs> and, yes. just, and that and, and that, that goes is reality exactly and that goes back to because interest you know what i find to be very interesting is that we we do have um looking at even the 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 debts the looking at the health sector and, and looking at how many how many men are presenting at hospitals for both unintentional and intentional injuries uh, a lot of men are, are, are dying from, from all of these different factors, external factors alone. So, so the households are losing men. They're losing them to violence. They're losing them to crime. And then a lot of the men just walk off, you know, and go about their business. And then, of course, when we look at the prison system and how many of them are, are, in, are being arrested, Right. Look, 2019, 2,639 um, 2, men were arrested. These men had a family, just as you're saying, they would have left the family, left the, 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 the lady alone to take care of the children. So you're right. There are so many factors that are at play and there are so many things that we need to do. And I, I really believe that we, we need to we need a more integrated approach to 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 look into fixing these issues because we don't have to continue being amongst the top four for murders in the world that we don't need to it's just it's just really not necessary so so um dr z what i'm seeing um from bible days um some of the strategies in Bi bible days that come that fight and kill men it may not be the same strategies but the enemy employing other strategies to destroy and uh, rib our home of our men. Yes. And as a result of that, their women don't know uh, what it's like for a father to be there. And even women don't know how, how um, to respond to a husband. So um, um, it affects, and also boys, <laughs> don't know what it's like to operate as a, a growing into a man and end up operate as a man so it's really a um 
a tremendous attack, a great, great um, attack on our men. So as you say, having this, then we know to pray more strategically. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, oh, somebody mentioning in the chat, we can even look into our churches. Yes, my sister, yes. In our churches, we have uh, about 70% of our churches are females. This is, this is, and this has been, this is how it has been aside from Brother Brown time but in Calderwood, where I, I don't, I don't know that reality that Brother Brown experienced in Calderwood with all the men going, because I grew up seeing, and, and you know what is interesting? I remember um, a brother was mentioning, some question about marriage came up recently. And uh, um, I was joking with him that the, the reality is that it's so much easier for a brother to find, <laughs> to find a wife because 70% is women, right? Um, whereas, you know, looking, looking. The pastor shaking his head. I see him shaking his head. But the, 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 the like data. I agree with sir too, you know, I agree with sir. No, no. No, um, no. The, the fact is that, but we can't, we can't run away from the data. We have more women in the church. We have more women in the churches. Mm -hmm. So if you are, if you are in a church, and seventy percent is women, and thirty percent males, and you this you you want to find a husband within that thirty percent, you're competing with the rest of the the percentage of the females. <clears throat> you know. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just I'm saying sorry. we're going off on the wrong wrong time <laughs> at this point in time, and it's the reading that conversation. <laughs> Let's get you back on track, and then you close off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, sir, because I I speak in data, you know, so that's the thing. But um, when it comes the, the the marriage thing, that's a whole other thing. Because once the Lord finds, once the Lord has someone for you, then that's what it is. So we know all of that. Um, but the church. We see the gender disparity in our churches, in our workplaces, and in our schools. And uh, we, see, we see a different type of gender disparity in crime, in our prison system, and uh, in our hospitals. And that is, that is what the data shows. So that is the reality. And I think, I think that will be Wait, I'm seeing, oh, someone just mentioning that they, over the last three decades, we have had an attack on our men. Do you remember seeing men in charge? Um, but not seeing that much anymore. Well, we've always been having an attack on our men and it is getting, it's getting worse. And so we need to do as much as we can. And I, I really believe that as a, as a body, as a body of Christ, outside of just praying that there are some actions that we can look into taking to really engage and uh, deal I, with our young men. Um, Dr. Z, I think I'm here thinking too that even sometimes we of ourselves are the lower self to become tools by, by um, the enemy to really kill our men. And, it, and I'm not trying to be hard on our women and um, at a times when women doesn't function in where um, God want them to be, they um, end up become a tool in the enemy hand. Um, and they actually destroy our men. Because, uh, 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 and so I'm saying, both all uh, so for us, men, let us see how we can nurture our men. And also, if we can try our best to function in our position, then um, the younger men would want to ask, um, uh, what's that word? Um, look Emulate. for us, hey, see Pastor Dave, Pastor Amata Brown, that is my example. Mm -hmm. So um, if we can set an example, and as I'm saying again, I'm going to say it again. If women, wives, mothers can function in their position, they um, won't end up become a tool in the enemy hand in killing our men. A lot of men in our home are dying, crying out. Well, interesting point you made, Brother Farkison. Um, one of the things, though, is that we live in such a matriarchal society that a lot of women don't have a, minute, a man. So, so everything that they do 
is just based on their own self and it's not that they have they have someone with them because there are so many so many persons that have been raised by their mom alone while the father is mm -hmm. elsewhere True. so that that is it um so i i think it's just i think it's it's just both both sexes just need to do all that they can do um performing in their roles and in their functions and uh, agree social in intervention intervening in the lives of uh, our youngsters or young men in particular since we see since we see the attack and being and of course we can't forget that we have a lot of our young ladies that are attempting suicide a lot of our young ladies are being sexually assaulted right and these sexual assaults are are happening primarily from the men so i i i would say that what needs to happen is just from both sides because the reality is that most of our families don't have a man in there and that's just that's just what it is all right so i think that's it for me so pastor i will hand over to you sir god bless all right. you all thank you thank all for listening thank you very much Thank you very much, Sister Zara. Praise the name of the Lord. We thank God for this evening and for such informative data that we can use and has come to us and, be, and bring to us the reality of the day in which we live. Um, and as she said before, you know, it helps us to be strategic in our praying. And when we rise from prayer, so, and so as the scripture says, if my people were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. So we see that the land is in need of healing in more ways than one. When we rise from prayer, we want to rise with ideas to put systems in place. Um, there are a couple of things that Bethel does. You know, we continue to support our children and to en try to ensure that they remain in school. We want to thank God for that. We want more ideas, more vision, more things that we can do as a people, you know, and once we come out of prayer, the Lord will give us ideas like he gave Nehemiah um, that which he needed as to how to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He gave Joshua how to attack AI, you know, and so we won't be operating on our own, on our own ideas, but if we are led by the Lord, then the systems that God would put in place, like he gave Joseph, it was, um, the systems that need to be put in place so that you could save the nation. And so we want to come out of prayer with God's agenda to save the nation because it is his will for all to be saved, both male and female. And we see the attack coming on both you know, because the enemy is out to destroy God's people. And that's, that's, that's just the reality. And so we thank God for Sister Zara tonight and um, such a beautiful presentation to our hearts. And may we pray earnestly. And like I said, come out of prayer with God's agenda to rescue, to deliver, to bring salvation to a nation. Our work is great, but our God is greater in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you again. Thank you again, and may God bless you much. Um, I think we have a few prayer requests before we go tonight. We want to pray for these as we get ready to go. So prayer for healing. Um, Evangelist Oliphant not feeling well. Um, has stomach pains. Father, we come before you. We honor you. We bless your wonderful name. What is awesome privilege to be able to gather like this in this fashion. Oh God, to learn more of you, to be enlightened of the situations in our day and to know how to pray. God, my Savior, I pray that like Nehemiah received information about the city of Jerusalem, we have received information, oh God. And we, I pray that we'll give ourselves into prayer so you will speak and deposit within us that which is necessary to make a change in our nation, in our society. And so God, my Savior, we look to you. And as we pray for these, Sister Oliphant, right now, God, 
you can be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. There's nothing that is too hard and there's nothing that is impossible with you. And so we take you at your word. You said you were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon you and with your stripes, we are healed. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, we declare healing in Sister Oliphant's body right now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, hallelujah. Let your healing virtue flow, hallelujah, in the name of the Lord. Sister Karen McKenzie's son, Shamari Williams and his friend Alton met in an accident since evening. Lord, whatever the situation is, we pray for your divine intervention. We pray, God, for your healing. We pray, God, for consciousness. Oh, God, we pray that if any of these are not yet saved, that they will come to that place and realize the frailty of life and how important it is to surrender to you before it's too late. And so even this situation will be a turning point in the lives of years. Oh God, my say these persons who have submitted requests in the name of Jesus Christ. And so we commit them into your care in your name, Jesus. Sister Winsome Mother Norma Barnes, who is not eating much and complaining about feeling bad in her lower abdomen. She is to do a blood test and also a test for her kidneys. Father, we hold Sister Norma Barnes before you right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus, mighty God and Savior. Hallelujah. We pray from this house. Oh, God, my Savior, to her house, to her body. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, her body, your temple. My God and Savior, move by your spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ that even my God and Savior, that healing virtue will flow. You said we shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And we pray from this place where your name has been dedicated. Hallelujah. For healing, healing for Sister Barnes right now in her body. In the name of Jesus Christ, give her a good report. We believe your report, Lord. Your report says we are healed in Jesus Christ's name. Sister Petal Chana, request prayer for complete healing and for favorable result for some medical tests that she has done. Even Sister Chana, we hold her before you right now, Lord, and we ask for favor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Intervene, my God, into her situation and turn it around for your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Touch our minds. Touch her spirit. Hallelujah. And let your kingdom come and your will be done. Oh God, we pray again for each of these that their minds will be stayed on you so you can keep each in perfect peace. Hallelujah. Let your anointing sweep over each and every one. Hallelujah, because your anointing makes the difference. My God and Savior, Jesus, like you touched me. Oh God, and you've touched many of us. Oh God, do it again for these as we hold their names up before you and we anticipate your miraculous touch and we give you thanks even now. In your precious name we pray. Hallelujah, amen and amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Pray in the name, praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Jesus. And so our Bible studies continues on Tuesday nights at 7.15, our prayer meeting on Thursday at 7.30, and our youth service at 7.15 on Friday. Our Sunday school continues online. We ask for you to join with us, share with us as we continue to break the bread of life. All our major services are uploaded to the YouTube page. Please like and subscribe with this Bethel United Church Apostolic Portmore. God bless you immensely. Just in case you have a prayer request or you just need to talk to somebody about your situation, somebody will answer your call. The numbers are displayed on your screen. Please feel free to share, to call. Somebody will be there to counsel with you. Somebody will be there to pray with you. Somebody will be there to be there for you. God bless you immensely. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Again, those who are visiting with us, those who are um, sharing with us, those who are fellowshipping with us from near and from far overseas, we thank God for you and we pray God's strength so we'll continue to strengthen you and to overshadow you and to keep you in all of his ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 
Let's just raise our hands for the benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Have a good night. Have a